What kinds of homework questions do you have today? We're going to be looking at section 8.3, random thoughts. Are coincidences truly as amazing as they first appear? appear? Uh, before we look at that, I want to remind you, study group meets tonight, okay? So if you can go to study group, that's great. If you would like to meet with the tutors one-on-one, -on -one, even if it's a Skype appointment, you can uh, go ahead and reach them at uw gb.edu backslash, I think that's a forward slash, tutoring. <laughs> okay? All right. Let's look at random thoughts. So the question that this opens with is, what's the most amazing coincidence you or someone you know has ever experienced? So I'd love to hear about your amazing coincidences. The most amazing coincidence you or someone you know has ever experienced. Does anybody have a coincidence they can share? We could get started with the author's coincidence here on the screen. During the great Sammy Sosa Mark McGuire home run race of 1998, Mark McGuire tied the home run record of 61 home runs on his own father's 61st birthday. What an amazing coincidence. What other coincidences can you share? Can you think of anything that happened? <coughs> yeah, what did you have? Uh, my friend and I were just randomly shuffling our Spotify playlist and we both got the same song. Uh, so you hit random shuffle, both of you, on your Spotify list and both came up with the same song. Wow. What are the odds? <laughs> what, uh, what other uh, coincidences do you have? I have one. My daughter is named Victoria Ann. She used to be, to be Victoria Ann Adsit, but she married her husband, and her husband's mother's name is Victoria Ann. So now my son-in-law has a mother named Victoria Ann Schwan and a wife named Victoria Ann Schwan. Their birthdays are one day apart, too. It's kind of a mess trying to, <laughs> trying to keep that straight. What, anybody have any other amazing coincidences? I bet you're saving them. You're saving them to tell somebody later, aren't you? You're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and see how likely it is that you would have amazing coincidences. Your author calculates that out. If I can find it here. Here it is. Okay. So if you think of a one in a thousand chance of something, something that's only likely to happen one in a thousand chance, he takes that probability, because we've calculated probability in the earlier section there, and he says that the probability that such a one in a thousand event will happen at least once in 10 years is 0.97. So that's pretty likely. And after 20 years, the probability that at least one such unlikely event will happen to you is 0.9993. In other words, even if we select in advance each morning a one in a thousand coincidence that we would count for that day, each of us is almost certain to experience that coincidence from time to time. <clears throat> so randomness does happen, and that's what this section is about, randomness. We're supposed to expect the unexpected. I wanted to show you a set of pictures here. Okay, let's see, if, can I make this bigger? I guess you can see it pretty good. So there's six pictures here. These are random dots from a computer in five cases, but in one case, the dots are placed by a person trying to behave randomly. So can you tell which 
box is different from the others. Which one is a person trying to behave randomly versus a computer that actually is randomly choosing data points? Yes. The bottom right. <coughs> Very good. The bottom right. And how could you tell this is different than the other five? Perfect, because the points are evenly dispersed in the one where the person's trying to behave random. They must feel like that's what a computer would do. But actually, randomness gets clusters. Randomness is not evenly spread out. It gets clusters. In fact, we have a coin flipping example here. 200 coin tosses in one box, and then the other is a person writing down heads or tails trying to be random. So one of these is a set of real heads and tail tosses, and one is a person trying to be heads and tails. So let's see if we can help. Oh, yeah, here you go. Now we have, we have runs of five or more heads or tails in a different color, either red or blue. So the 200 on top have lots of those runs of red and blue, five heads or five tails or more at once. And the one at the bottom has <coughs> only one, five heads at once. Does that help you tell which one of these is done by a person and which one is uh, by a person trying to be random and which one is done by a person actually tossing a coin? Which do you think is the real coin, co coin toss? Top or bottom? Which one do you think? Top. Top, good. Yes, the top is the real coin, coin toss because randomness happens. You really do get runs of five in a row or six or seven in a row when you're tossing coins. Anybody ever had that experience? Like when you're playing a, a game and you keep looking for a particular dice roll and it doesn't happen and you keep thinking... It can't be another 10. We've had 10 four times. It should be a 6 soon, and no, it's not. So um, randomness happens. We do get these clusters, just like we had clusters of points up here. Randomness does not mean evenly distributed, although there are actually people who make computer random generators that evenly distribute because that's what people are expecting. <laughs> but real randomness does not have that even distribution. Now, this is interesting as well. Here we have flipped a coin 11 times and repeated that over a million times. Then that whole experiment is done three times because what we're doing here is we're looking for tails coming up 10 times in a row. Because remember I said in in real randomness, you do get this repetition going on. So these are 1 million to coin tosses three times in a row. And in the first trial, 10 tails came up 1,010 times. In the second trial, 10 tails came up 1,033 times. And the third trial, 10 tails came up 955 times. So the question is, on the 11th toss, what is the probability that you'll get a tail? If you toss a coin 10 times and get tails, what is the probability on the 11th toss that you'll get tails? Anyone tell me? Can anyone tell me? You know, Nicholas? 50%. Still 50%. Yeah. You're not going to have a different probability. History doesn't matter. So if you toss a coin, unless of course you have a two-headed coin, but <laughs> if you toss a coin ten times in a row and it comes up tails, then 50% of the time it'll come up tails the next time. And so that's what these are showing. Out of those 1,010 times where you had tails ten times in a row, 495 got tails, 515 got heads. So that's pretty close to 50%. Remember we looked at the law of large numbers that says if you do an experiment 
a, a large number of times, then the relative frequency of the outcome will approach the probability that's been calculated if you've calculated the probability correctly. So these experiments were done a large number of times, so we're approaching the um, probability outcome of 50% or 0.5. So I'm not going to test you on 8.3, and it's not going to be on the quiz, but I did want to look at it with you because I think these are kind of interesting ideas, that randomness does happen, and randomness does not mean evenly spread out. Clusters happen in randomness. Uh, I'd like you to read 9.1 on your own. I often assign, I actually usually assign 9.1 as a reading assignment. So you will go to Chapter 9 in your read study, um, read, what does it say, read study prepare or something like that, and then choose stumbling through a minefield of data. In chapter 8 we were looking at probability, in chapter 9 we look at statistics, gathering data and making it visible. So 9.1 9 is what not to do. <laughs> so it's a very interesting section, it has lots Lots and lots of examples of what not to do. I'll narrow it down a little bit. So I would suggest you print this so you can choose a printer version and underline different aspects of each different scenario that uh, stands out to you in the scenarios. So there is a couple little sections you can skip. You can skip the section on some anonymity, some anonymity. Okay, you can skip that, and you can skip the section total anonymity. The other sections, please read and be ready to answer questions on, just like you would in in your other classes where you have reading assignments and you have to answer questions. Let's write that down so you know what you have it in your notes. Okay, so I'm not going to give you any quiz questions on section 8.3. 9.1, read and expect questions on the quiz. If you printed out the the review very long ago. I did update the review, um, so you'll have to you'll have to check it against the review that's posted now for 9.1. You can skip the section that has some anonymity. and total, total anonymity. We are going on to section 9.2, where we look at um, displaying data. <clears throat> so I would guess at some point in your life you will need to display data and so we're going to look at today how you could do that. I know I like to display data myself. I often gather my students' scores together and I want to look at different ways of seeing how they're doing. And we'll talk about some of those ways. See if you can tell what do these numbers have in common? 3.23, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5,
0 0.360, 82, 1.08, 46,702. Does anybody know what those numbers have in common? Those are all averages. So the 3.23, does anyone know what that might be a grade point average? Whoops, I said what it was. <laughs> that is a grade point average for somebody. How about the 0 0.360? That one's a sports related. Does anyone recognize what number that would fit with with sports? Baseball, that's right. Yep, batting average. 82, that's a quiz average from one of my classes. 1.08 is another sports average. Anyone recognize that? That is an earned run average. How about the 46,702? Does anyone recognize that number? That's the average salary in Green Bay. I'm going to show you one of the averages in section 9.1 in the section that I'm asking you to read. This is a little bit about Lakeside School. So the Lakeside School has an excellent reputation in many respects, but when we look at the average income of its graduates in 1997, we are so excited that we consider packing up the entire family in the SUV and moving to Seattle immediately. We learned that that year the mean income included salary, including salary and investments, of all the graduates of Lakeside School was more than 2.5 million. In fact, this average includes recent graduates who are still in college and graduates from the 1920s who are now dead. Wow, what a record. Now, that does seem almost unbelievable, but it is explained when we learn that Bill Gates and Paul Allen, Microsoft founders, were Lakeside School graduates in 1996 and 1997. So their 18 billion and 7 billion kind of add to that average and kind of tweak it a bit. So averages are calculated in a number of different ways and that average was a little bit was quite a bit thrown off by those two huge values. So we're looking at whenever possible, visualizing a situation and how to display data so that we don't mislead people. That, that uh, Lakeside School mean average was a little bit misleading, actually quite a bit misleading. This is one of the best graphs ever done, the best displays of data ever done. This is by Charles Joseph Menards in 1861. It's a thematic map of Napoleon's 1812 to 1813, invasion and retreat of Russia. So what's wonderful about this display is it shows so much information. First of all, it is a map. So this is the coast of France. Here we have Moscow. Does anybody know um, who won? Who won when Napoleon went to not Moscow? Pardon? Russia. Russia, yes. Nobody's ever taken Moscow in the winter. The winter defeated Napoleon. And you can see that when you look at this graph because the thickness of the bar represents the troops. So you see the troops path. Here you see a, a little group going off and they're in gray as they advance on Moscow and they're in black as they retreat. So here, for example, this little group that left returns home. And the thickness of the bar tells how many troops there were. So right here, this gray bar represents 422,000 troops. 
And you can see the group getting smaller and smaller. Here they get smaller as a group branches off. They eventually return down here. Um, they're getting smaller and smaller as winter takes hold of their troops and decimates them. By the time they return, there's only 4,000. 422,000 leave to march on Moscow. 4,000 reach the coast again. So besides showing the different troop locations and their size, this also shows the temperature. So there's little temperatures down here with bars pointing up to the uh, different locations to show the temperatures and how the, you can see how the temperatures impact the troop sizes. It's very sad, but a, a wonderful display of all that data. We're not going to get that fancy. We're going to work with histograms and box and whisker graphs. So I think both of those are very nice ways for you to display data if you need to at some point. So we want to make sure you know how. So I'm going to give you a couple displays of data. Here we have prices of homes sold recently near Green Bay um, by the time they were posted on Zillow. So they're in no particular order except how Zillow posted them. Here's another display of data. Final exam scores in Math 101 in a particular semester. So two different sets of data. What would be one way to make the data more accessible? That's what our, our plan is today. Try to learn to make the data more readily, apparable, so, uh, readily apparent so it's not just this big stack of numbers, but instead describes the situation. What would be one way to um, help this data be more clear to your reader? Very nice, very nice. So you could clump them together by um, scores. So I didn't, I didn't quite do that, but I did group them in order. Okay, so now I, I range from lowest scores to highest, and that will take us actually to what you said, to clumping them in uh, groups. So just rearranging your data from lowest to highest makes it more clear what was going on. And you can see, well, it wasn't all dismal. They weren't all 28s. There were some upper in the 90s. Or all the houses aren't going to be 300,000. You can get some for a lower price. What's another way to dis um, describe your data? We talked about it at the beginning of class, actually, at the beginning of this section, rather. Well, you could list the average. So an average helps make big bunches of data more visible. So this average was 69. And the average price of the homes sold in this list is 218903 but we saw in that, that Lakeside School example that the average doesn't always help. There's three different ways to describe averages. These, these were the means. Let's talk about averages in a minute. <coughs> Who knows how you <coughs> calculate the mean? Anybody? Yes? Uh, you add everything up and divide it by the Go Add everything up and divide it by the number of data points that you added up. So the sum of all the numerical data divide that by the number of data points. Divide 
divide that by the number of data points. So that's the mean. You will be expected to be able to take a list of data and find the mean. The median is another measure of central tendency, and I think it would have been better to use the median in the Lakeside School instance. I don't know if the author lists the median for that example. No. Does anybody know how you calculate a median? Yeah, it's the middle number. So let's write that down. Put all the numbers in order. The median is the middle number. Did you just say what to do if there's two middle numbers? If there are two middle numbers, Average them, <coughs> which is as you said, add them and divide by two. So you'll hear both of these described as the average. So it's important to know which description of average is being used, the mean or the median. And it's nice to know if they're close together or not. Let's find the median on the price of these homes sold recently. So I did number, I did number them once I had them ordered. And there were 30. So since there's an even number, there's not going to be a middle number. So I drew a line down the middle. Above this line are 15 prices, and below this line are 15 prices. So the median would be taking these two, 178,000 and 198,000, the 15th and 16th numbers, and averaging those. So let's go ahead and do that. So the median of prices of homes sold near Green Bay, we take the 178,000 and the 198,000, divide by two. So in your calculator, you add these up and hit enter and then hit divide by two. You should get 188,000. So the 188,000 is lower than the 218,000 mean. And you can see why that is when you see that there's this 669,000 that was averaged in all of these and brought the mean up higher than the median is. So half the homes sold in Green Bay were under 188,000 and half the homes sold in Green Bay were above 188,000 in this list of, in, in the time period that I picked these off of Zillow. How about you try one of these, okay? Can you find the median? for these final exam grades. And once you find the median, think about why it might be different than the mean, which is 
the 69 at the bottom of the page there. So these are numbered as well, there's 26. So you um, see there's a line drawn in the middle, there's 13 grades above that line and there's 13 grades listed below that line. So since there's not all middle grade, you would take the 71 and 74, the two middle grades, and average them. Did anybody else get 72.5? Okay, thank you. So that was higher than the 69.15. Does anybody know why the median was higher? Yeah, so we're averaging these two grades, not the entire list. We're just finding what had, uh, what was the, 72.5 had 50% of the grades below and 50% of the grades above. Whereas the average mean includes this 28 getting in there, which is very small compared to um, the um, median. So finding the mean and the median are a good way to just sum up your data, especially if you can include both to give people a feel for what's going on. We're also going to look at histograms and unboxing weaker plots. So today we'll be looking at histograms. Histograms group grades into um, bins or whatever you're graphing into bins. And the histograms always list the frequency of a particular grade. So you see these vertical axes say the frequency or the number of, because the histogram always lists how often something's happening. I love to make histograms with my student grades. I can quickly see how many get in the 90s, how many get in the 80s, how many get in the 70s, and so on. Now these two histograms look very different, but in fact they're displaying the same data. So what you choose to group by makes a big difference. In the bottom, these are exam scores grouped by 5%, so 50 to 55, 55 to 60, and so on. In the blue graph, they're grouped in sets of two points, so 92 to 94, 94 to 96. I think in this case, the 5% are better, or maybe even 10% would be better yet. Depends what you want to show and how you want to show it. So someday when you're showing data, you have to decide what um, size bins to put your data in. Let's make a histogram for the prices of homes sold recently near Green Bay. So we're going to need some bins. Let's group ours by 50,000. So when you make the bins, you don't have to cover sections where there aren't any values. So I don't have to start at 0 to 50. I can start 50 to 100,000. And then I'll go on from there in 50s. So 50 to 100,000 then um, 
it's really 50k. Okay. Then 100,000 and one dollars to 150,000, 150,000 and one to 200,000, 200,000 and one to 250,000, 250,000 and one to 300,000. 300,001 to 350,000. I don't, oh yeah, 350,001 to 400,000. Then I have a big gap in my data until I get to the 669. So I'm not, I'm not going to write all those empty bins down. My histogram needs to show those empty bins, though, because that's important. That's part of the landscape of the data, that there's a bunch of empty bins there. So on my tally, I'm not going to write all these empty bins down, but I will on my histogram. So this 669 falls between 650 and uh, 700,000. Okay, then what do we have here? And again, if this is your own data, it's a lot easier because you can just write all over it, but you're writing it down, so I'm writing it down too. So let's see, between 50 and 100, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Between 100 and 150, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Between 150 and 200, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Between 200 and 250, 1, 2, 3, 4. Between 250 and 300, 1, 2, 3, 4. Between 300 and 350, 1, just 1. Between 350 and 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And 1, way up there. And now I would add all these up to make sure I didn't miss any. Yeah, that's 30. Okay, so we have all of our data sorted, and now we'll make the histogram. So if you have graph paper, then take out the graph paper. If you don't have graph paper, then for sure use a straight edge, okay? There's some elements of your histogram that are required for you to get full credit. We want to make sure you have all of those. You need a title. It should say histogram, and then what is it a histogram of? So this is histogram of prices of homes sold. recently near Green Bay. Now you can only put in your title what you knew. So I have the word recently. If you actually know the dates, then you put the dates down. Okay. All right, then a histogram should always have a vertical axis that says frequency. How high does that go? It needs to go <coughs> at least up to six, but I like to have a little space on top, so I'll go up to seven. And it should start at zero. Do not put breaks in your graph. You'll see one of the ways that data is distorted when it's displayed is by leaving um, leaving a big break here and just showing the top, and that kind of exaggerates the differences. And 
So that's not something I want to see on any graphs that you're handing in, okay? And that title should be frequency on that vertical axis. Now your bins on the bottom include the empty bins. You don't have to start at zero, but once you start, there shouldn't be any gaps and the bins should be consistent. These are all consistent size bins. You don't make some bins $2,000 and some $5,000 and some $50,000. The whole point of trying to make the histogram is to show the picture accurately and that means comparing how much is in one side in one bin to another and if you have different values for your bins then you're distorting that okay uh, so I'm just going to start at zero because there's only one empty bin so that's not so bad so I'm going to start 0 50 100 150 200 250 and we're going all the way up to 700,000 here 300 350 400 450 500, 550, 600, 650, 700. So the title for that then is prices in thousands. Let's get our data then. We had five in the 50 to 100,000 range. So use a straight edge so you don't have all squiggly bars drawn here. Six in the 100 to 150. Five in the 150 to 200. Four in the 200 to 250. <clears throat> 250 to 300, there were four. Three hundred to three fifty, there was one. Three fifty to four hundred, there was four. And then six fifty to seven hundred, one. Now you hand that graph to somebody and they can tell a lot of information from that. What, um, where would you say most of the homes being sold, what prices were they around? Well, more, more around here, right? Yeah. I mean, there's... There's some up here as well, but you would say, okay, mostly they're around here, so um, the median's probably right around in here somewhere. And then you'd say, okay, there's an occasional very expensive home. I would actually call these very expensive, at least in my price range. <laughs> but there's uh, one really super expensive one up here. We're going to um, look at this then and label it, and that's how we're going to start class on Friday because this is as far as we got in my first class. So we'll label it and make sure we have everything there that you need and that you're aware of what you need. And that will be a good way to review this as well. I'll see you on Friday.